Thank you, Chastity, a beautiful voice. Thank you for giving that back to the Lord. I'm so proud of myself. I actually waited till she finished singing before I came up here ahead of her. That's a big accomplishment again. <laughs> I'm learning. I want to do a couple of things. First of all, uh, at, at 11.30 today and also 5.30 tonight and 5.30 Wednesday, our library is open. It's right through those double doors and to your right. Um, my wife and I do not have cable TV, so that means we don't have 85 channels. We have one of those things where you get free TV. I like that word free. And we only get about 12 channels, and I still have a hard time finding anything worth watching. You know it? Um, the Weather Channel is okay, but it's gotten to where most of it is bad weather, so I can't even watch that anymore. <laughs> So what I do is we buy DVDs or in our church library back here, you don't have to buy them. You just sign a little card and you get to take them. And I know Hallmark has that 30 days of Christmas movies starting around Thanksgiving, but you don't have to wait because we've got a whole truckload of them back there. And turn I've looked at six now, is that right? And I really like this. This was based on a novel by Max Licato. It's called The Christmas Candle. Have any of y'all seen that? Okay, so I'm going to turn this in at 11.30, right after church. If you want to be, get that, that'll be available. Well, but it's a wonderful thing. It doesn't cost you anything, and it's a good uh, message in there, too, and the other movies as well. All right, uh, do we have any children in here who are following me with this kids' bulletin? If, if we have some children, hold that up so I can see where you are. I see one, two, three, four, good. Anyone else? All right, adults, it's really fun. So if you could talk, there, I see one over here too. If you could talk Miss Celeste into giving you one, adults, it's pretty good. And kids, I'm going to be your envy today because I color-coded my word search. I found all the words, all spelled correctly. Uh, I'm, I'm so proud. This is a good day for me, isn't it? I'm on a... <laughs> now, Miss Celeste always asks us, what song today helped you focus? Well, they're all good, and I like the one I just heard from Chastity Wright. That was such a great message in that song. But I hadn't heard that yet So I, uh, when I filled this bulletin out. And I looked at today, we're singing a hymn uh, for invitation here in just a few moments. I have decided to follow Jesus. And I picked that one as my favorite because I'm going to be talking uh, this morning about uh, walking in a worthy manner and about following uh, Jesus Christ from the book of Colossians chapter 1 verses 1 through 20. Um, and so I just want to invite our uh, children, zero in on that white bulletin there and use it as we go through. Um, also, I want to tell you on behalf of me and Terry, thank you for that unexpected um, gift of appreciation um, I enjoy working with the, the staff here, um, and I work with different ones in different ways, but it's, uh, it's a privilege to me. Last week, I was in Emmanuel Baptist Church in Greenwood. They're a church about the size of Friendship Baptist Church. Had a good time with them, but I was so waiting and eager to get back uh, here, so I'm glad uh, I'm here. Um, and Dr. Paul said that I'm stuck with you. I think it's the other way around, actually. I think uh, y'all are stuck with me for a while. Um, but you know, um, I've been in the pastor search process on the other side of the equation. Uh, one time when I was at Columbia, a church in South Carolina contacted me, and they flew Terry and I over to South Carolina. We had a great visit with them and several good meetings with them and it really all came down to being invited in view of a call and they did and we put it on the calendar and do you know what happened on one week before I was to go back to South Carolina and preach in view of a call <clears throat> I was in the pastor study at my church in Columbia and it was just before evening night worship uh, Sunday night uh, worship and uh, I was praying I said Lord uh, I've gone through this process about whether you're moving me from Columbia to South Carolina, uh, from Mississippi to South Carolina, and 
Uh, Lord, I, I had even taken a legal pad, drawn a line down the middle and put pros on the left, cons on the right. And I had a, Randy, I had a pro and con sheet for going and then a second sheet pro and con sheet for staying uh, where I was. And I had some pretty good reasons to go and some pretty good reasons to stay and some cons about going and some cons about staying. And so all, all, God let me do that. <laughs> I went through that process for several weeks, praying over that pros and cons list. And it really came down to this. W when everything was said and done, the pros and cons just about balanced out and neutralized each other. And it didn't tell me anything uh, more about the will of God and what he wanted me to do. And on that Sunday night in my study, about a half hour before evening worship, I prayed something like this, Lord, I've been looking at this stuff for six weeks and I'm absolutely exhausted. And I said, frankly, I don't care if I stay or go. There's only one thing important to me and that is I want to know I'm where you want me to be. And then you know what happened? When I prayed that, I felt the Lord tell me, okay, since you're going to leave it up to me now, <laughs> Why don't, why don't we start there? That would be save a lot of time, wouldn't it? But when I got to that point, the Lord told me, I want you to stay right here. Now, I wish I could tell you I learned from that. I didn't. Some years went by, and I got an invitation to teach at Mississippi College. The only problem is I had fallen in love with my church family, and what did I do? I pulled out my yellow pad. I put pros and cons for staying, pros and cons for going. And there were pros and cons for both, and they balanced each other out, and I prayed over that list for six, six weeks. And finally, in exasperation, don't have a clue. God, just tell me what you want me to do, and I'll do it. Okay, so you come back to turning it over to me again. And as soon as I did, even against what I thought God would say, he led me from the church to Mississippi College. Now, I'm in a strategic place because now I teach 19-year-olds Foundations for Christian Ministry. And that's, this is a class where these 19-year-olds feel called to serve the Lord and walk in a manner worthy of that calling, as Paul's going to say in Colossians 1. But they don't know, for the most part, to what ministry he is going to call them to. Pastoral, church staff, evangelist, maybe a missionary, maybe something else. And I have the privilege of telling those young people, you don't have to know. Because the only one who needs to know already knows, and that's God. All you have to do is walk with him every day day and he'll take care of the rest. Amen? So on being on the other side of the search committee process, I've had it where the Lord told me not to go and I've had it where the Lord told me to go. And when I hear uh, Dr. Poss come up here and share with us the latest updates and all, I don't get discouraged by whatever news he shares with us. What I'm hearing is reinforcement from the own, my own experience that I've had in the ministry for 40 years now that God absolutely wants us to trust in Him and wait on Him. And however long that wait is, if He thinks it's good for us, then we should accept it as good news and take it as good for us. Amen? So we will get a pastor, I promise you that. God knows who He is, I promise you that, and He will tell us when He thinks we're ready, and not a second before. So you, uh, I want to pledge to you and your committee, we will give fervent prayer to that uh, process, and thank you for being honest with the Lord in every step of that, every phase of that. Well, walking, you know, Terry and I, We'll get home tonight around nine, a little bit after maybe, but we go straight to bed because we get up at four and we're at the healthplex at five and we go about five times out of the seven a week. We go about five days and we walk. And this may come as a total shock to you, but Terry is a faster walker than me. <laughs> we start at the same place. 
I like to blame it on my football knees, but my friends like to say, well, you got a little more payload to carry around the track than Terry does. I said, thank you. <laughs> but we walk and she, you would think she's so in love with me, she would just walk along with me, but no. <laughs> she has to lap me. I do have a rule though, if she passes me the third time, I just knock her down or something. <laughs> I don't mind that she walks faster than me. I don't even think about that. I just, I walk and think, and it's a good time to do some thinking and meditating and praying and thinking about the Bible. That's what I do, uh, lap after lap after lap. But our friends who walk with us, they seem intent on reminding me, you know, your wife walks faster than you do. And I said, well, you know, isn't that a great thing? I think I just see the positive side of that. I'm so happy my wife walks faster than me. Well, how is that positive, they ask? I said, well, um, because Terry walks faster than me, I know, and it proves that she loves me. And they go, huh? I said, yeah, think about it. If she walks faster than me, and I caught her anyway, it must mean she wanted me to catch her. Isn't that right? So that's how I know. Is that grimace a good thing? <laughs> that's how I know she loves me. Now, I won't talk about how we walk because uh, we, all of us walk a little bit different. Some have a waddle, some are fast, some are, we have this one guy, he walks so fast, I don't even know how he does it without running, but he does, he's walking. But this scripture today talks about walking in the Lord. And I want to talk about walking in a worthy manner since we belong to the Lord. And I just quickly want to share with you uh, just a few things like the vocabulary of salvation. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God, our Father. We give thanks to God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which you have for all the saints, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of which you previously heard in the word of truth, the gospel, which has come to you just as in all the world also it is constantly bearing fruit, increasing even as it has been doing in you, also since the day you heard of it and understood the grace of God in truth. And when I talk about the vocabulary of salvation, listen to this. He used the word apostle. Then he used the phrase will of God, saints, faithful, grace, peace, thanks, prayer and praying and pray, a faith, love, truth, fruit, down in verse 7, which I haven't read yet, he uses servant and a few other words uh, along the way. And, if, and kids, if you're following that white bulletin now, you could say the preacher mentioned in the Bible, God does all these things. He gives us wisdom and knowledge of prayer. He talks about fruit and thanksgiving and forgiveness. All those things are in this text. It's the vocabulary. Look at what Paul, how he identifies. He says, an apostle of Jesus Christ. That ministry class I told you about a moment ago, this past couple of weeks and going into the next couple of weeks, we're talking about spiritual gifts. And if you want to, if you've never done a spiritual gift inventory, you can get on Google and Google Lifeway spiritual gift inventory and, and you'll see a free PDF. You can download it. It has 80 questions and you fill them out uh, on a number scale, one to five and then you tally up the numbers and they tell you how to tally them. And it'll kind of show, based on your answers to those 80 questions, what kind of spiritual gifts seem to be your forte, your strengths. And one of my students, uh, she asked the other day, I got apostleship, what is that? And it was right at the end of class and I said, that's too important for us to have a sound bite answer, we need to go into a little more detail. But what if you uh, do this inventory and you feel like 
you have the gift of apostleship. Paul felt he had that. What does it mean? We get our word apostle from the Greek, and the Greek literally takes two words and glues them together. That's how concrete they were in their thinking. Uh, that's how straightforward they were. Apo, A-P-O, the first three letters of apostle, is simply their preposition meaning from. And the rest of the word comes from their Greek verb, stello, which means to send. So apostello, apostle, means someone who is sent from. And in a biblical context, an apostle is someone who is sent from the Lord, and by the Lord, I could also say, but he's sent out, he or she, from the Lord to share their faith testimony, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the plan of salvation. And uh, I was able to send this uh, young lady, in fact, I uh, emailed it to the whole class. I said, if you have the gift of an apostle, you have, it, sh it should manifest itself in a sense that it's not enough for me uh, to go to church and hear sermons and do Bible studies and that sort of thing. It's good. They don't knock that. They're not against that. But if you have the gift of being one cent, you feel like I've got to get out of this place and go out there uh, and find those people who need the Lord Jesus Christ. And you'll never have rest in your soul coming into a church house and sitting on the pew and never going. If you have that call and gift of being one sent out, there's a general sense in which we're all sent to share our testimony. But if you have the gift of apostleship, it's going to be like Jeremiah said, it's like fire in your bones. You cannot ignore it. You feel compelled. I have to go. And I put in my email to the class. Um, I just did this yesterday, by the way. Um, I put in my email to the class. If you have this gift of apostleship, it's often accompanied by the gift of evangelism, a strong desire to share faith and lead people to Christ. And it's often accompanied by a fearlessness and even a desire to go to people who are totally different from you. In other words, out of your socioeconomic classification, out of your racial classification, and mostly out of your cultural classification. Um, Dr. Jerry Rankin, we're so blessed to have him teaching missions at Mississippi College. In fact, he's helped us pioneer developing a concentration just in missions work. But he talked about how eye-opening it was for him and his wife, Bobby, to go to Indonesia to share the gospel and how many years it took them to learn the language, the culture, and how to share the good news in a way that these other people uh, could understand it and come to make professions of faith in Christ. He said you had to wait for years for decisions, but it happens. And when Paul says, uh, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, or by the will of God, um, he's saying a lot there because before he never went like to go out anywhere and talk about Jesus. He made it his aim to destroy the church. In fact, Acts 8, 1 said he was wreaking havoc <clears throat> on the church. And for him now to write the Colossians, a group of people he never met, he didn't go to Colossae and found the church like he did at Philippi and Thessalonica and Berea and the witness he gave in Athens and then down in Corinth and Ephesus. Paul founded a lot of churches, but he never went to Colossae that we know about. So look at this vocabulary. Apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. You remember when Jesus said, when you pray, pray like this in Matthew 6, 9 through 13. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. And what's the next line? Thy will be done. In other words, you, and I keep putting this question there. I've been asked so many times, so I'll keep throwing it out every time I come across a different answer to the same question. How can you know you're saved? One way you know you're saved is you have a desire, a compulsion, an inner push to want to do the will of God. And it's not so much as asking, God, what is your will for my life? That makes it sound like you're so important that you need some kind of specialized plan. 
A better way to do is leave my life out of the equation. Don't pray that. Pray it like this. Lord, teach me your will and I'll get, get after it right away. I will live to do your will. And it occurs to me thinking back on that Sunday night in the study when I was trying to decide, do I go preach in view of a call? I didn't have a peace about it. And when I don't have a peace, that just tells me I need to pray more. And when I prayed, God, I'll do whatever you want me to do. I don't care if it's staying or going. I just want to be sure you're in it. If you're in it, the rest will take care of itself. So what is your will? Not your will for my life. What is your will? You are the one that directs me. You put me where you need. I know y'all are aware that the baseball, Major League Baseball uh, uh, League Championship Series are going on right now. Do you know what the manager does? The manager knows every player in the dugout. He knows the nine players that need to start. He watches his pitcher, and he knows at what point in the game he needs to bring in someone from the bullpen. In other words, the players aren't calling the shots. They don't go to the manager and say, listen, I know I'm a bullpen a relief pitcher, but I got it all figured out. If you'll bring me in at the second out of the fourth inning, I can get you all the way to the end of the game. They don't do that. It's not their job. Their job is to prepare and be good at what they do, and they get compensated for it pretty good, right? But it's the manager's job to know who's in the dugout and who do I need on the field right now. And I, I want you to hear this. When this Bible right here says that God made Jesus the firstborn of creation, the head of all things, the church, and everything else, it said so that he could have, in the old King James, he could have the preeminence. In the New American Standard Version I'm using today, it says that he could have first place. Isn't that interesting? And how can you know you're saved? You can know you're saved because you want Jesus Christ to occupy first place in your life. And you can know you're saved because you'll adopt this vocabulary of salvation, the will of God, saints, faithful, grace, peace, thanks, praying always for you, Paul says, heard of your faith. See, he heard of it because he hadn't met them. He said, since we heard of your faith, in verse 4, in Christ Jesus and the love which you have for all the saints, see that they love brothers and sisters in Christ, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, do y'all realize you have hope laid up for you in heaven? They did. And he goes on. You, uh, you previously heard the word of truth, the gospel. So they're basing their life now on the truth. And then he says, uh, this gospel has come to you just as in all the world. Also, it is constantly bearing fruit. You know what Satan does? Satan tries to convince us, and he works overtime during interim periods, because when you go for a while without a pastor, if you're not prayed up and close to the Lord, you're a prime candidate for the, uh, Satan to whisper in your ear and say, I wonder what's wrong with friendship. Can't get a pastor. And you start thinking negative, and you start believing the lies that Satan's whispering in your ears. I want to tell you something. There's nothing wrong with friendship, or if there is, there's nothing Christ can't fix. Amen? He wants us to wait on Him and not listen to Satan. He wants us to wait on Him. He wants us to be aware of what He's doing. And, and, and listen, don't fall for His lies. Instead, fall in love with God's truth. If I had to pick a nation today that I would say is really troublesome for the United States, I wouldn't pick Russia or China. Those are always up high on the list, aren't they? The nation I would pick right now would be Iran. I cringed when President Obama uh, agreed uh, to a nuclear uh, deal with them and then agreed to pay $150 billion. They hate Israel. 
the very nation that God said is the apple of my eye. In other words, you poke God in the eye and you're in big trouble, buddy. Iran is troublesome. They stir up terror all through the Middle East. On the day that Barack Obama signed that uh, executive order and promised to give the $150 billion, the president of Iran took the Israeli flag and laid it on the floor and he walked across it and said, we're going to destroy the state of Israel. That scares me. I could even adopt language like that's a demonic state or whatever. I'm not going to do that, though. Because if I ask you another question, what nation right now on the face of the earth is having more conversions to Jesus Christ than any other nation on the planet? You know what it is? Iran. Satan wants you to think church is an old-fashioned thing. He wants you to think the gospel is from an ancient time and of no benefit today. He wants you to think that the forces of the church folk and the Christians are losing ground and things are slipping and it won't be long now before all the churches are closed. Whisper, 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 whisper. That's Satan. But when he does that to you, just say, well, Satan, let's think about this for a minute. If the church is done, how many come so many people are getting saved in places like Iran? How come in China, the most populous nation on earth, people are dying to come to Christ? Literally, figuratively, and metaphorically. They want to know the Lord. One of the joys of teaching at Mississippi College, we have a lot of Chinese students. I was talking to a Chinese student not too long ago. And I said, now, you're doing very well here. By the way, his English was, uh, you could tell he had an accent, but it was not a heavy accent. I said, you're doing very well. When you graduate, are you going to uh, apply for citizenship in the U.S. or what's the deal? You know what he said to me? He said, oh, no, I don't want to be a citizen of the United States. He said, don't get me wrong. I'm so glad I could come here and get a good education, better than what I could get in my own country. But he said, in my country... You don't have to go out and look for lost people. <laughs> They're everywhere. And I want to go back and I want to teach them all the things I'm learning about Jesus Christ. And China has one of the biggest uh, number of Christians in all the world. They're so much bigger than ours. We have 324 million, 25 million people. They're like 1.2 or 3 billion and that's when they had a one-child policy. Now they just lifted that last year where if couples want to have two children, they can. Uh, India is right behind them uh, in terms of population. God is working all over the world. These shoe boxes we're asking you to pack, they're going to go all over the world. Uh, the whole thing that Franklin Graham heads up, it's going to go all over the world. The World or Global Hunger Fund feeds hungry people. Muslims are coming to Christianity. Why? Uh, man, uh, I was talking to Jimmy Long. Jimmy is a member of First Baptist Florence where I was interim pastor for 14 months. And he had just come back from a mission trip in Malaysia or Indonesia, I think it was, but it was the largest Muslim country in the world. And he said, people are accepting Christ in record numbers. And I said, well, Jimmy, uh, did you figure out why that is happening? He said, well, I'll tell you what this guy we were working with, he's a Christian, but he was a Muslim. And you know what he told me? He said, all I see the Muslims doing is wanting to be destructive and preach hate and against Christians. And what we see the Christians doing are not putting down Muslims or trying to blow Muslims up or anything like that. He said, the Christians are doing like you guys. Y'all have flown halfway around the world, literally, and at your own expense, purchased building materials, and you're pouring concrete and building what they call over there long houses. In their culture, they'll have a long building with rooms off that main hallway, and all the different branches of the family live in one long house, and they got their own little 
private sleeping quarters, but then they come together to eat. And he said, you know, we're poor people. And when the Muslims say, don't trust those Christians, but they don't do anything for us, and the Christians fly halfway around the world, and they bring food, and they build homes for us, they're showing they love us, and those Muslims are being converted to faith in Jesus Christ. So you have this wonderful vocabulary. Secondly, you have the workers of salvation besides the vocabulary. Look at verse 7. When Paul's talking about they heard this gospel and they understood the grace of God in truth, in verse 6, he goes on, Just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow bondservant, who is a faithful servant of Christ on your behalf. Keep your finger there and go to the last page of Colossians chapter 4. Look at verse 12. Epaphras is mentioned again. Epaphras, who is one of your number, a bond slave of Jesus Christ, sends you his greetings, always laboring earnestly for you in his prayers, that you may stand perfect and fully assured in all the will of God. And so all I'm saying here, uh, it's very fitting for you as a church to honor your staff here. These are co laborers in God's vineyard. He's called them here at this particular time. Yes, we need a pastor. Yes, we need a, a youth minister and so forth. But guess what? God has all that in control and none of our situation today, not one aspect of it caught God off guard. Amen? So we got to keep our eyes on him and trust him to bring here whom he wants. Maybe he's uh, breaking and reshaping like Jeremiah 18. Maybe he is doing a new thing that if you were to hear the full bit, your ears would tickle. All that's in Scripture. But let's let God be God and let's trust Him with it. Amen? So I want to close then just by looking at the source of salvation, Jesus Christ. In verse 10, we have that verse, You walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. Worthy of the Lord to please Him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work, increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthening, strengthened with all power according to His glorious might, for according to His glorious might, for the attaining of all steadfastness and patience, joyously giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. And then he mentions forgiveness there in verse 14. But look at 13 and 14. He rescued us from the domain of darkness. What else did he do? He transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Yes, God forgives us in Christ. And now the rest of our passage, 15 through 20, he's just bragging on Jesus. Listen to this. Talking about Jesus, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. By Him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through Him and for Him. I hope you see that. He is before all things, and in Him all things are. Hold together. In other words, Jesus is the glue that keeps everything going. He is also the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have, and here's that phrase, first place in everything. King James says preeminence, first place. And that's our goal as Christians. That's how we walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. We put Him first in absolutely everything we do. In 19, He says, It was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in Him. Uh, it's later called the fullness of the Godhead dwells in Him. In other words, if you got Jesus, you got everything. And through Him, through Jesus, it's God's pleasure to reconcile all things to Himself, having made peace through the blood of Jesus' cross. Through Jesus, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. Another way to put that is, in this source of salvation, Jesus Christ, 
Jesus is the introduction to the Christian walk. Jesus is the content of the Christian walk. Jesus is the summary and conclusion of the Christian walk. And when you have Jesus, you have everything. Would you stand as we pray? Father God, we love you. We thank you for loving us. Lord, we've been in your house. We've prayed. We've sung. We've uh, heard your word, Lord. Testimony. Father, thank you for loving us. And Father, we just pray now that you would bless us even in this time. Lord, right now during this invitation time, I'm going to ask members to come to this altar, Lord, and pray to you. And Lord, there's so much to pray for. First, we want to pray that we are giving you first place in our lives. And secondly, Lord, I want to ask the members to pray for our pastor search committee, Lord, that they would continue to put you first, Lord, as they seek out your man for this pastoral position. And Lord, if there's anyone here, we always hold out the gospel to anyone who is not yet a Christian. Lord, if this is the day of their salvation, now is the time, Lord, as your word says. I pray, Lord, they'll come and take me by the hand and just say, Brother Wayne, I want to give my life to Jesus. Lord, we pray that in Jesus' name right now as we sing. Amen.